Last session, the clock ran out on a bill to allow campus carry in Georgia, but its supporters are back to try again. We'll talk with two legislators who say if you're 21 and have a license, you should be allowed to take your gun to school. While state legislators debate Medicaid expansion, hundreds of thousands of Georgians remain in medical limbo. Now that other red states are considering signing on, what are the chances for expansion here? Lawmaker starts right now. Welcome to another edition of Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. We're now 18 days into the 2016 session, getting really close to the halfway mark and closer to crossover day, which is now scheduled to fall on leap day, Monday, February 29th. Before we talk with our panel, let's check in with Shelby Lynn for tonight's Capitol Report and a look at the issues that are on the move. Shelby? Thanks, Bill. Topping the Capitol Report tonight, the Marty expansion effort now underway at the Capitol. We recently did a show on this, so you know just how contentious this effort can be between supporters and opponents of the expansion measure. And complicating it even more, Alpharetta Senator Brandon Beach introduced dueling MARTA bills last week. The future of MARTA expansion in Georgia may have been resolved today with a compromise on two MARTA bills that were in two separate Senate committees. Beach's first bill, SB 313, was mistakenly sent last week to a committee chaired by Roswell Senator John Albers, a critic of rail service. Beach introduced a nearly identical bill two days later, SB 330, that was sent to the friendlier Senate Transportation Committee. I asked uh, Senator Albers to move it to um, uh, transportation, and he has agreed, and he will move that on Thursday. He did want to have his hearing because he'd already had it scheduled, so we agreed to have the hearing today at 2 o'clock. Then it'll move to transportation, and Senator Chairman Williams will give me a hearing hopefully on Thursday. Beach stressed the importance of creating a viable transit system in Metro Atlanta. He says companies are leaving the suburbs for urban and in town areas where more of their employees are living these days. Athena Healthcare, 600 jobs in Alpharetta. Their employees could not take it anymore and were not coming up Georgia 400. Beach says his bill will leave it up to the voters, not the politicians, whether to expand MARTA into Fulton and DeKalb counties. We're not raising taxes. We're flexing the half, pen, uh, half of the penny that was allocated in the SPLOS on House Bill 170. So we're not going over the cap. We're not raising taxes. And the voters will have the final say. Atlanta businessman Mark Toro says mass transit is a critical component of economic vitality. He says it's a necessity in order to compete with other regions and that Atlanta is behind the curve. The transit systems of, of cities, I'll call them lesser cities, smaller cities, Denver, Portland, uh, others that have grown much faster than we have because we've been stuck. Under Beach's bill, voters would decide whether to expand MARTA through a half penny sales tax. The tax would fund new rail lines north along Georgia 400 in Fulton County and east to Emory University in DeKalb County. In both the House and the Senate today, a very busy day with several bills passing in both chambers. That includes SB 255 in the Senate, a bill that would revise the state's garnishment laws. It's the result of a federal judge's ruling that stopped all garnishments in Gwinnett County and other parts of the state because the law was outdated. Specifically, the uh, ruling uh, indicated that debtors were not being given the notice of their exemptions to which they might be eligible to claim, nor were they given notice of the procedure. Senator Jesse Stone says Georgia's code had not been revised in more than 50 years. The vote on the bill was unanimous and it now goes to the House for review. We know that there are many, many bills that have been introduced in this session that would create exemptions for some people of faith, so that they would not have to follow the same laws that the rest of us have to follow. A crowd of some 100 people, mostly civil rights groups from across Georgia, braved the cold weather converging on the Capitol today to protest the religious liberty legislation in the House and Senate. Former State Representative Simone Bell, who was openly gay, warned her former colleagues in the legislature about getting caught up in rhetoric that divides Georgians. We have seen this over and over. Bills that say they are about protecting one thing 
when the real goal is to target and discriminate against LGBT people. At last count, there were eight bills that focus on the issue of religious liberty. So far, none of them have been debated on the floor of the House or the Senate. Many of the elected officials uh, in Georgia support Hillary Clinton for president. Yay! Yay! Georgia Democratic lawmakers came together today to encourage early voting for the upcoming March 1st primary. But their real purpose was very clear. They were there to support Hillary Clinton as their candidate for president. The state of Georgia is growing. It's growing fast and it's changing. And we need a president who understands what's happening in this country, what's happening in the state. Someone who's willing to not only put forward progressive ideas, but has the practical capacity to get them done. And that is the future president of the United States, Hillary Clinton. And finally tonight, the House Judiciary Committee discussed two religious liberty measures today. We'll have more on that for you tomorrow. That's it from the Capitol. Sending it back to you in the studio, Bill. Thanks, Shelby. So let's get right to our discussion tonight. For that, I'm joined by Jim Galloway. He's the longtime political writer at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Representative Mandy Ballinger, a Republican from Canton, Senator Steve Henson, he's the Democratic leader in the Senate from Tucker, and Representative Rick Jaspers, a Republican from Jasper. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we want to start, Jim Galloway, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, Representative Jasper and, and uh, uh, Mandy Ballinger, have, they're really pushing hard on campus carry. What does this measure call for? And how's it being received down there? All right, now I'm going to stand ready to be corrected here. But it calls for, if, you're, if you carry concealed, if you have a license to carry concealed, you can carry in almost any, any campus area, any campus building, except for uh, fraternities, sororities, uh, dormitory, dormitory units and athletic events. And Howard, what's the climate feel like to you down there I for this? I think it's, you know, this is, a, this is a fight we've had since 2007, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's, it's, it changes from year to year. I, I'm sensing with, with San Bernardino and, and, and a couple of other incidents happening, I'm sensing more pressure on, on, in behalf of this. I mean, you've got House Speaker David Ralston uh, backing this, I think, for the first time. Representative yes. Jaspers, let's let's. Uh, I want to give the journalist a chance to frame uh, the, uh, the measure. Uh, he said it pretty correctly, didn't he? He did say it very correctly, and I think it's one of those bills that when we put it in, it's restoring people's rights, and especially the thing we want to make sure people understand is folks who are over 21, who've been vetted by our court system, to have a weapon. Yeah, you know, they do it now throughout the state. You know, we went through we did House Bill 60 a few years ago. You know, we called it the uh, Safe Pro Protection Act. It got hung around. It was the um, guns everywhere bill. And there was all this cry that all these terrible things were going to happen. And they didn't. Because the people who have these licenses are good Georgians. They've been examined by their peers, you know, probate judge. They take the responsibility of carrying a weapon very seriously. And that's where this is all around. And that's why you see this very, very low, very low incidence of of crime committed by people who have a license. It's almost nothing. It, it, you, last year, mm -hmm. the uh, regions, the Board of Regents, really fought against this legislation hard. And whether it was their pressure or other circumstances, the bill failed in the 11th hour. It was pulled out of the, the gun, so-called guns everywhere bill. Uh, are you getting the same kind of pressure from the uh, regents this year that you uh, got last year? Are they still determined to try to bat this thing down? Um, I, I, don't, I think Representative Jasper, since he was on the conference committee, because it passed the House. Right. Um, I think that's and really important. Right. And you know, it failed in the conference. But yeah, of course they are. They've got their reasons why they don't want to do it. But I think you've got to look at just the strict facts of just like we said when Jim said of what's happened recently at Georgia State in a secure building at the library. We've had four robberies. And they're not just snitching people's computers either. And, you know, we look at just the statistics that the universities and colleges create themselves has shown that those aggravated assaults, you know, violent crime is way up. But violent crime generally in our world that we live in here in Georgia is down. And it goes right back to just the simple thing that people hate to admit that criminals love 
gun for his own. Senator uh, Democrat, go ahead, Jim. If, if, if I can, <clears throat> uh, just one one point that's that's been made is, uh, well, first of all, how would this work? Uh, because you 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 can't put a gun in a in a dormitory or a fraternity or sorority. So I understand how commuting students would be able to keep them in their in their automobiles. But otherwise, what, what kind of a costs are associated? We had Keisha Waits on here, I think, last week, mm -hmm. talking about uh, the, the, the universities and colleges would need to uh, set up gun safes. Uh, is, is that true? And how much money would that cost? Why would they? Well, if I'm... That's the, that's the answer, is mm -hmm. why. There's no reason for that. Currently today, an individual in Georgia, if they chose to, could break the law, could carry them anywhere. But when we look at what we're saying, yeah, there are going to be places they can't go. But when you look at the gun-free zone, it's a... Oh, I understand, but, but I'm talking about storage. If you can't take it back to your dormitory, Jim is suggesting, same question where, I've where, had. Where, yeah. where, where do you put, put it? it? Well, I, th I think the majority of students that are over 21 that do have a weapons carry permit, those are the people that are mostly living off campus. They're in apartments. Um, and they're in suggest. apartments and they're in private mm -hmm. residences or whatever. And they're, you know, I, th I think they have the, the right to defend themselves. And the simple fact is they wouldn't be able to carry them those places. It's as simple as that. Senator, Democrats aren't very excited about this legislation. Well, I mean, you know, as, as we heard from the Board of Regents, there's a lot of concerns about uh, safety on campus. I mean, most campuses do have police and, uh, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's not necessarily a partisan issue, but it's one where I personally have concerns about the safety and listen to those people running the Board of Regents. and. Uh, tend to think that it's probably not a great idea. We talk about carry permits on campus. I've got a Bill 73, Senate Bill 73, that says that you can ask for to see somebody's carry per permit. But right now, if a student had a gun on campus, law enforcement can't even ask to see their carry permit. So how do you know they really have a carry permit? And I think it could, uh, I mean, it could cause problems, everything from accidental discharges uh, to uh, students getting into a fight or maybe even some of the teachers not liking uh, students having guns in their classroom. But you look across the United States, there are states that have this. Those things don't happen. There's long-term states like Utah. They had this, that doesn't happen. I think you gotta go back to looking at who you're talking about. 21-year-old people, courts have looked at them. They're having a dangerous weapon in their hands. They are gonna be responsible, they have to be. But there's no reason, I think, Representative Ballinger, we first talked about it, is to create a world where you're making people victims. That's wrong. I think instead of guns everywhere, gun-free zones basically create victims everywhere. Well, because you know, you have a lot of victims. states, too, that have requirements that before you have a carry permit, you have some training. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia's one of the few states that has no training at all. Even South Carolina and Tennessee have some basic training for a carry permit. And Keisha Waits has introduced legislation that would require safety, uh, gun safety training uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for students carrying guns. Are you opposed to that kind of legislation? Very much. I don't think you should have to take a class to be able to exercise your constitutional rights. Nobody has to have a journalism degree to exercise free speech. Okay. Uh, Jim Galloway, I want to, you're, uh, the, the AJC this weekend uh, had a really interesting article about the laws, the statutes that legislators pass that they exempt themselves from. Of course. Of and it, course was, yeah. it was a fascinating piece. And one of the things, of course, that was mentioned is the Guns Everywhere bill exempted the state capital. People cannot bring guns into the state capital. Well, say it correctly. Okay. The guns everywhere. Well, the, you know, we carry the Safe Protection Act. Said that if you have a government building and you offer full time security, that's checking everyone coming in the building, on any government building, you can, you've created a gun free zone within it, and you're responsible for the care of the people in there. So yes, at the Capitol, it is total security, <coughs> just like it is in most all courthouses in the state of Georgia and many other government buildings. So we didn't really parse out saying, oh, well, just the Capitol, but we, there are lots of government buildings where this happens. But, but, but let it be said that the Capitol has the yes. access to the funds to set up those, those guard posts yes. and, to, and to give AR-15s to, to Capitol security people. And there are many of us who would say it's fine. <laughs> we would just, I'm, I'm with that. So, but. Let me throw out, I, I know we're getting into a really philosophical question, but, but it suddenly, this occurred to me this weekend, and I'd love to hear you all comment on it. Uh, Senator Henson, I think I'm correct in saying that we've made this fundamental shift in how we view taking care of ourselves and each other. It used to be that Americans, Georgians, looked to law enforcement to protect us from the bad guys out there. And what, 
what legislation like uh, this, this guns bill says is, no, it's really up to us as individuals to protect ourselves. We've shifted it from our more traditional thinking about who is responsible for our safety. Am I correct in, in that uh, well, assumption? You know, it's definitely the ball's moved on gun ownership and safety. I mean, I, I remember 20 years ago, we, there were a lot of people pushing back on when the, whether the Second Amendment meant an organized militia or the right to carry a constitutional right to, for everybody to have a gun unregulated uh, or, or with very little regulation. Um, but, you know, certainly I still look toward law enforcement to be, uh, you know, the most important protectors we have on the streets and in our community. Um, but there is a lot of dialogue about self-protection and, of course, uh, you know, we see cases where somebody's home's broken into. There was a case not too long ago in Georgia, and they were able to protect themselves. But we also see a lot of cases where gun violence is uh, very common in America, very common in Georgia, and, and for, for one reason, it's prolific uh, nature of guns in our community. Uh, Mr. Jaspers, if either one of you could answer this. Uh, would, would universities and college campuses enjoy any protection uh, if, if things go awry. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I've talked to campus security people, and the, the, what they're worried about is rushing into a live shooter situation and shooting down somebody with a gun in their hand who's trying to be a hero. And, you know, of course, <clears throat> that's dangerous. Is, 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 are there, is, is, there, is there protection in your bill for, for universities and college campuses. There's not. And that was brought up today to me also. And uh, it's something, that's the beauty of the legislature, is that when things brought up, then we can debate them, add them, subtract a bill as it moves through the, uh, through the process. And you know, we've talked about that. I've talked about that with the uh, Highway Patrol and how they attack a active shooter situation. And um, it's serious business. Do, am I hearing that there could be consideration for some for adjusting this bill somehow to uh, indemnify in some? What do you well, do well, about it? You know, once you um, put a bill in committee, it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> and a committee chairman and those and those people who are in the committees can do have their way with you and your bill and you without a whole lot of your. Uh, input and or, or desire. So we'll see. Is this gonna you gonna get this through this year? I hope so. You, are they gonna be able to pass this, do you think? What's uh, your You sense? know, I, I don't know. I mean last year it was intentionally caught up at the last minute, but it made it through both chambers. Uh, of course Senate, uh, the representative started early and it's been working on it. So you know it, it's gonna be one of those things that I think the last couple of days we're gonna be looking at has good chance to pass, but uh, still has concerns out there and with the Board of Regents uh, having concerns. Well, it's going to be fascinating to watch this unfold. Um, if we can, uh, Senator, we'll start this conversation and take a break and, and finish it up after the break. Um, we, we mentioned in the open that there it seems to be, and we've talked about it in this show, uh, more than ever, I think, there's this sense that the states that did not expand Medicaid are increasingly at least open to having the conversation in a way that they weren't a couple of years back. And we're starting to hear even Republicans in the Georgia legislature saying, maybe. Is this coming our way? Well, I think it is. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we kept hearing people say, well, we know it's 100 percent funded. Uh, we have hospitals in rural Georgia in trouble. Um, you know, the, the law was constructed in a way that actually took away uh, some payments to hospitals for indigent care because they expected the expansion of Medicaid. So there are a lot of pressures on the system to get the Medicaid expansion. But we heard, nah, you know, we've got an election, we might take over the U.S. Senate. So we can't do anything now because we might repeal it all. You know, that happened, it's still the law of the land. So now we're hearing, you know, we'll wait and see whether we get a Republican governor, uh, Republican president, a United States Senate, and a United States House. And maybe we'll repeal it then and we won't worry about it. But uh, certainly if we go into session next year and the, uh, the, the, added the thought is that it's not going to be repealed or replaced, then I think uh, many state leaders are thinking that we need to do so. Uh, Jim Stacey Abrams was on the show, the minority leader in the House, uh, the other night. She's introduced a bill which she, I think, has positioned to at least begin a broader conversation. Because certainly the bill's not coming from Republicans anytime. Well, no, no, and this is not a conversation that's happening in committee, committee rooms or on the, on the House or Senate floor. Right. This is, this is one of these back-channel <coughs> back conversations that 
everybody is having. And it's all, it's, it's not just about health, it's about economic development. You cannot put a new factory in rural Georgia if there's no access to health care. It's, it's, this is all about jobs. And, and truly, I, I, th I think uh, Senator Henson has a, has a very good point. It does, it does, November will tell us a lot about where this argument goes. The uh, Republicans still, I mean, although there are a few outliers, mm -hmm. you don't want Medicaid expansion. No. Because? No. Um, I, I just think it's bad for, bad for Georgia. It, it because are the costs too great down the road? I mean, the, gov the feds are going to pay 90 percent of the cost for uh, the, certainly the startup and for a certain number of years in, in, into the future. You well, but it tapers off. And I think that it, it, the, the cost to the state is just too great. Okay. It's a typers only 90 percent. I mean, it doesn't go down to 10. Uh, and we, we're seeing more and more industry groups like the Hospital Association and others. A hotel, a hospital association, and other groups coming in and saying this is something we need to look at. All right, we, we have to well throw in here just if I real can, quick, yeah. That you know, as people are sitting around talking, as you described, you know, we're looking at casino gambling, it going toward hope. I think there's a better conversation out there. Is those funds go to reckoning some of the issues we have in healthcare in Georgia? I think you'll find a better coalition of people that realize just as. Mr. Galloway said that our rural hospitals need help. I love this. We're going to have to take a break. But even before the casino bill has gotten anywhere, there's already a fight over yeah. the proceeds. <laughs> <laughs> Look, stand by, everybody. Uh, we're going to keep talking in just a minute. Coming up, in fact, on Lawmakers, <laughs> Reverend Franklin Graham declares that same-sex marriage is just the beginning of a moral onslaught to our nation. We're going to talk about his planned visit to Georgia's capital tomorrow and how he plans to get evangelicals out to vote. As we take our break, it's time for another round of Know Your Lawmaker. Representative Debbie Buckner is a Democrat from Junction City, representing House District 137. She was sworn into the General Assembly in 2003. And when she exhibits true grit at the Capitol, maybe it's because of the true grits she eats most mornings hand ground by her husband, Mike. The Buckners live at Fielder's Mill in Talbot County, one of Georgia's few remaining water-powered grist mills. Lawmakers returns in just a minute. What means more to you than the health of your children? Nothing. That's why a healthcare system completely dedicated to kids means everything. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, dedicated to all better. We all know that Jefferson Davis was president of the Confederacy, but did you know it was a Georgian, Alexander Stevens, who was its vice president? He was elected on this day, February 9th, 1861. Stevens was a native of Crawfordville. He'd already served in both the Georgia House and Senate and in Congress. Following the Civil War, Stevens returned to politics and was elected governor of Georgia in 1882. But he died in office after serving just four months. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. With me tonight, Jim Galloway, Representative Mandy Ballinger, Senator Steve Henson, and Representative Rick Jaspers. Um, Jim, I am going to start with you on this, too. Uh, Franklin Graham's coming into Atlanta tomorrow, coming to the state capitol for a big rally. Right. This is Billy Graham's son. Son of Billy Graham, uh, but he represents the organization right now. He has taken it a little bit harder right than his than his than his father did. He is he's got a 50 state uh, program of going into each capital. A lot of them as they are voting on the presidential primary are about to and trying to 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 push up the evangelical vote, which is over the last couple couple of presidential <coughs> election cycles has 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 been kind of uh, lackadaisical, if you will. You, the evangelicals uh, voters in this state represent a tremendous percentage of Georgia voters. If you get them to the polls, they're a potent force. They are. They <coughs> are. And, but I, but I think I mean the high water mark was I think 2004 when we passed the constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court has of course overturned that now, and 
uh, this is this is this is uh, the reaction of evangelicals. You've got uh, you'll have some some presidential activity around it. Ted Cruz has sent his father, Rafael Cruz. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll be speaking not at the at the Graham uh, Graham event, but at, at something earlier in the day at, at a breakfast. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a couple uh, uh, another couple stand-ins for for presidential candidates. So I would think in both of your districts mm -hmm. there is a pretty healthy percentage of people who would. Call themselves evangelicals. Fair yes. to say? Very fair. And what's your sense of how uh, ready they are to, to really be mobilized in the presidential campaign coming up? I think they're very ready. I, th I think that they're ready to, to, to make a strong stand for America. I don't think they, they, they agree with a lot of the way that the executive branch has been going, and I think they're ready to make a stand. Up in your district, too, I assume, up I've, in Jasper. I've had two pastors, one of them in Nepal, who sent me a Facebook message to make sure that I was going to attend with some <laughs> of his parishioners, you know, some of the folks who go to his church. And absolutely, I mean, and uh, I guess I'm a guy that likes all involvement. I don't mind questions. I don't mind being, being questioned and, um, and held accountable. You, know? you, haven't, you haven't thrown your support to any of the Republican candidates yet, but... So I'll put you on the hot seat just a little. Is, is Ted, does Ted Cruz represent more of the evangelical philosophy than any of the other Republicans as far as you can see? Oh, yes, and in, in where I'm at, they do. But, I, but then again, if you go to the uh, Bojangles to drink coffee in the morning or <laughs> wherever. Have a biscuit, too, I hope. Have a biscuit, yeah. I mean, you know, um, Trump is dominating the news media. It's dominating what people talk about. And, so he's the big uh, guy in the room. And Franklin Graham has said nice things about Donald yeah, Trump. Yeah, absolutely he has. Um, Steve, when you think about the force that evangelicals can re represent, you're not going to get into the Republican primary, no reason why you should. But what kind of uh, uh, force do they represent moving forward into a general election pitting, say, well, I don't want to name a Republican, but probably Hillary Clinton still on the Democratic yeah. side. You're supporting her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're hoping to get some, even Jan <laughs> some support from the community. Um, you know, certainly a lot of things. We think expansion of Medicaid, for instance, is a issue that a lot of the religious community support. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some support. But the, uh, of course, battle in the Republican uh, presidential primary is is one of the big focuses now. I'm curious uh, what effect uh, the rally will have and communication will have on uh, casino gambling in Georgia, uh, which seems to be moving quickly through the legislature where 20 years ago, uh, things like Sunday uh, liquor sales and casino gambling wouldn't have been considered. Jim, uh, we're both old enough that we remember how evangelicals turned out way back against Zell Miller when he was first trying to pass lottery. He passed it, it was but it was thing. close it because was, of those evangelicals. And let us not neglect to say that we've got, what, eight or, or nine religious liberty bills in the legislature right now, and that is a prime message of Mr. Graham. Well, I was about to ask that. Do you imagine that this rally uh, begins moving some momentum in the direction of some of those religious liberty bills beyond um, the Pastor Protection Act, which everybody seems to be coming together around. Do you think it's going to get to be, uh, uh, this will help give momentum to those other bills? I think certainly, because it is something that the evangelicals have focused on. So I think it will give, give momentum to some of those bills. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, anything that brings 5,000 people, you know, I think they're seeing tomorrow at, at Liberty Plaza, you're going to listen. And I think it's a great message. And I'm excited to see that many people come, utilize a great space there. We're out of time. I love that he set an expectation. Representative Jasper said 5,000 people will be there tomorrow. We're marking it down. We're going to write it down. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. Look, we're out of time. Thank you all so much for Thank being you. with us Thank tonight. You. It was a pleasure to have you here. That does it for day 18 of the 2016 session. 22 legislative days to go. Tomorrow's likely to be a big day down at the Capitol with that evangelical rally. We're also expecting a news event about the proposed expansion of MARTA. Whatever happens at the Gold Dome, you can expect to hear about it on this show, Lawmakers. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at GPB News or our website, gpb.org slash lawmakers, and you can, get, you can watch full episodes there. Be sure to catch Political Rewind live tomorrow at 2 here in Atlanta on 88.5, but also on the statewide network. Thanks for being with us tonight. See you tomorrow.